foreign markets considers the efforts of capitalism to save itself by marketing its surplus products abroad and what results from these efforts if our analysis of present-day society is correct we have the enormous populations of the modern industrial countries living always on the verge of starvation their chance for survival depending at all times upon the ability of their employers to find a profitable market for a surplus of goods at first the employer seeks that market at home but when the home markets are glutted he goes abroad and so develops a phenomenon of foreign trade and rivalry for foreign trade as the basic fact of capitalism and the fundamental cause of modern war let us get clear a simple distinction concerning foreign trade there is a kind of trade which is normal and would thrive in a free society in the united states we can produce nearly all the necessities of life but there are a few which we cannot produce rubber for example and bananas and good music these things we wish to import we buy them from other countries and incur a debt which we pay with products which the other countries need from us wheat for example and copper and moving pictures with cowboys in them this is equal exchange and a natural phenomenon a free society would produce such surplus goods as were necessary to procure the foreign products that it desired when it had produced that much the workers would stop and take a vacation until they wanted more foreign products but under capitalism we have an entirely different condition we produce a surplus of goods which we have to sell in order to keep our factories running and to keep our working population from starving and note that it does not help us to get back an equal quantity of foreign goods in exchange we must have what we call a favorable balance that is we must have other people going into debt to us so that we can be continually shipping out more goods than we take back continually piling up credits which we can negotiate or turn into cash so that we can go on and repeat the process of making more goods selling them for more profits and putting the surplus into the form of more machinery to make still more goods and still more profits and then after a while we come upon this embarrassing phenomenon nations which buy and do not sell must either do it by sending us gold or by our giving them credit the sending of gold cannot go on indefinitely because then we should have all the gold and if other nations had none that would destroy their credit on the other hand business cannot be done by credit indefinitely for the very essence of credit is a promise to pay and payment can only be made in goods and how can we take the goods without ruining our own industry fifteen years ago i pointed this out in a book the argument was irrefutable and the conclusion inescapable but the few critics who noted it repeated their usual formula about dreamers and theorists now however the business mills have ground on and what was theory has become fact before our eyes we have trusted the nations of europe for some ten billion dollars worth of goods and they are powerless to pay and if they did pay they would bankrupt american industry france wishes to collect an enormous indemnity from germany but nobody can figure out how this indemnity can be paid without ruining french industry the french have demanded coal from germany and have got more than they can use and are dumping it in belgium and holland with the result that the british coal industry is ruined the french clamor that the germans must pay for the destruction they wrought in northern france and the germans offered to send german workmen to rebuild the ruined towns but the french denounced this as an insult it would deprive french workingmen of their jobs 
so I might continue for pages, pointing out the manifold absurdities which result from a system of industry for the profit of a few, instead of for the use of all. Ever since I first began to read the newspapers, some twenty-five or thirty years ago, all our political life has been nothing but the convulsions of a social body tortured by the constricting ring of the profit system. Everywhere one group struggling for advantage over another group, and politicians engaging in playing one interest against another interest. My boyhood recollections of public life consist of campaign slogans having to do with the tariff, production and prosperity, reciprocity, the full dinner pail, the foreigner pays the tax, etc. The working man under the profit system is like a man pounding away at a pump. He can get a thin trickle of water from the spout of the pump if he works hard enough, but in order to get it, he has to supply ten times as much to someone who has tapped the pipe. But the tapping has been done underground, where the working man cannot see it. All the working man knows is that there is no job for him if the products of cheap foreign labor are allowed to be dumped on the American market. That is obvious, and so he votes for a tax on foreign imports, high enough to enable his own employer to market at a profit. He does not realize that he is thus raising the price of everything that he buys, and so leaving himself worse off than he was before. All governments are delighted with this tariff device because they are thus enabled to get money from the public without the public's knowing it. The foreigner pays the tax, we are told, and as a result of this arrangement the Steel Trust, just before the war, was selling its product at a high price to the American people and taking its surplus abroad and selling it to the foreigner at half the domestic price. And we see this same thing in every line of manufacture, and all over the world. We see one nation after another withdrawing itself as a market for manufactured products, and entering the lists as a marketer. One more nation now able to fill all its own needs, and go out hungrily to look for foreign customers, adding to the glut of the world's manufactured products and the ferocity of international competition. At the close of the Civil War, the total exports of the United States averaged approximately $300 million, and the total imports were about the same. In 1892, the exports first touched $1 billion, while the imports were about nine-tenths of that sum. In the year 1913, the exports were nearly $2,500,000,000, while the imports were $600 billion less. And in the year 1920, our exports were over $8 billion, and our imports a little over $5 billion. So we have a favorable balance of almost $3 billion a year. And as a result, we are on the verge of ruin. This iron ring of overproduction and lack of market exercises upon our industrial body a steady pressure, a slow strangling. But because the body is in convulsions, struggling to break the ring, the pressure of the ring is worse at some times than at others. We have periods of what we call prosperity, followed by periods of panic and hard times. You must understand that only a small part of our business is done by means of cash payments, whether in gold or silver or paper money. Close to 99% of our business is done by means of credit, and this introduces into the process a psychological factor. The businessman expects certain profits, and he capitalizes these expectations. Business booms because everybody believes everybody else's promises. Credit expands like a huge balloon with the breath of everybody's enthusiasm. But meantime, real business, the real market, remains just what it was before. It cannot increase 
because of the iron ring which restricts the buying power of the mass of the people by the competitive wage so presently the time comes when somebody realizes that he has overcapitalized his hopes he curtails his orders he calls in his money and the impulse thus started precipitates a crash in the whole business world we had such a crash in 1907 and i remember well a wall street man explaining it in a magazine article entitled somebody asked for a dollar we learned one lesson by that panic, at least. The big financial men learned it, and had Congress pass what is called the Federal Reserve Act, a provision whereby, in times of need, the government issues practically unlimited credit to banks. This, of course, is fine for the banks. It puts the credit of everybody else behind them, and all they have to do is to stop lending money, except to the big insiders, and sit back and wait while the little men go to the wall and the mass of us live on our savings or starve we saw this happen in the year nineteen twenty and for the first time we had hard times without having a financial panic but instead we see prices staying high because the banks have issued so much paper money and bank credits end of chapter fifty nine Chapter 60. Capitalist War Shows how the competition for foreign markets leads nations automatically into war. In a discussion of the world's economic situation, published in 1906, the writer portrayed the ruling class of Germany as sitting in front of a thermometer, watching the mercury rising, and knowing that when it reached the top, the thermometer would break this thermometer was the german class system of government and the mercury was the socialist vote in eighteen seventy the vote was thirty thousand in eighteen eighty four it was five hundred and forty nine thousand in eighteen ninety three it was one million eight hundred and seventy six thousand in nineteen o three it was three million eight thousand in 1907 it was three million two hundred and fifty thousand in 1911 it was four million two hundred and fifty thousand writing between 1906 and 1913 i again and again pointed out that this increase was the symptom of social discontent in germany caused by the overproduction of invested capital throughout the world and the intensification of the competition for world markets i pointed out that a slight increase in the vote would be sufficient to transfer to the working class of germany the political power of the german state and i said that the ruling class of germany would never permit that to happen when it was ready to happen germany would go to war to seize the trade privileges of some other nation there was a time when wars were caused by national and racial hatreds there are still enough of these venerable prejudices left in the world but no student of the subject would deny that the main source of modern wars is commercial rivalry in nineteen seventeen we sent eugene v debs to prison for declaring that the late world war was a war of capitalist greed but two years later president wilson who had waged the war declared in a public speech that everybody knew it had been a war of commercial rivalries the aims of modern war makers are two first capitalism must have raw materials including coal and oil the sources of power and gold and silver the basis of credit parts of the world which are so unfortunate as to be rich in these substances become the bone of contention between rival financial groups organized as nations some sarcastic writer has defined a backward nation as one which has gold mines and no navy we are horrified to read of the wars of the french monarchs caused by the jealous quarrels of mistresses 
but in 1905 we saw Russia and Japan go to war and waste a million lives, because certain Russian Grand Dukes had bribed certain Chinese Mandarins and obtained concessions of timber on the Yalu River. We now observe France and Germany vowed to undying hate because of iron mines in Lorraine, and the efforts of France to take the coal mines of Silesia from Germany and give them to Poland, which is another name for French capitalism. The other end sought by the war makers is markets for manufactured products, and control of trade routes, coaling stations, and cables necessary to the building up of foreign trade. England has been the mistress of the seas for some three hundred years, which meant that her traders had obtained most of these advantages. But then came Germany, with her newly developed commercialism, shoving her rival out of the way. The Englishman was easy-going. He liked to play cricket and stop and drink tea every afternoon. But the German worked all day and part of the night. He trained himself as a specialist. He studied the needs of his customers, all of which, to the Englishman, was unfair competition. But here were the populations of the crowded slums, dependent for their weekly wage and their daily bread upon the ability of the factories to go on turning out products. Here was the ever-blackening shadow of unemployment, the mutterings of social discontent, the agitators on the soapboxes, the workers listening to them with more and more eager attention, and the journalists and politicians and bankers watching this phenomenon with a ghastly fear. So came the Great War. Social discontent was forgotten overnight, and England and France plunged in to down their hated rival once and for all time. Now they have succeeded. Germany's ships have been taken from her, and likewise her cables and coaling stations. The Berlin-Baghdad Railroad is a forgotten dream. The British sit in Constantinople, and the traffic goes by sea. American capitalism wakes up and rubs its eyes after a debauch of Presbyterian idealism and discovers that it has paid out some $20 billion in order to confer all these privileges and advantages upon its rivals. Ever since I can remember the world, there have been peace societies. I look back in history and discover that ever since there have been wars, there have been prophets declaiming against them in the name of humanity and God. As I write, there is a great world conference on disarmament in session in Washington, and all good Americans hope that war is to be ended and permanent peace made safe. All that I can do at this juncture is to point out the fundamental and all-controlling fact of present-day economics that for the ruling class of any country to agree to disarmament and the abolition of war is for that class to sign its own death warrant and cut its own throat. American capitalism can survive on this earth only by strangling and destroying Japanese capitalism and British capitalism and doing it before long. The far-sighted capitalists on both sides know that and are making their preparations accordingly. What the members of the peace societies and the diplomats of the disarmament conferences do is to cut off the branches of the tree of war. They leave the roots untouched, and then, when the tree continues to thrive, they are astounded. I conclude this chapter with a concrete illustration cut from my morning newspaper. We went to war against German militarism, and to make the world safe for democracy, meaning thereby capitalist commercialism. We commanded the German people to beat their swords into plowshares, that is, to set their Krupp factories to making tools of peace, and they did so. We saddled them with an enormous indemnity making them our serfs for a generation or two, and compelling them to hasten out into the world markets to sell their goods and to raise gold to pay us. And now, how does their behavior strike us? 
do we praise their industry and fidelity to their obligations here are the headlines of a news dispatch published by the los angeles times on december tenth nineteen twenty one at the top of the front page right hand column the most conspicuous position in the paper read it and understand the sources of modern war new attack by berlin dumping goods by wholesale cheap german trash puts thousands of americans out of employment glove plants shut down and potash industry killed by teuton intrigue end of chapter sixty chapter sixty one the possibilities of production shows how much wealth we could produce if we tried and how we proved it when we had to one of the commonest arguments in defense of the present business system runs as follows the amount of money which is paid to labor is greatly in excess of the amount which is paid to capital suppose that tomorrow you were to abolish all dividends and profits and divide the money up among the wage workers how much would each one get the sum is figured for some big industry and it is shown that each worker would get one or two hundred dollars additional per year obviously this would not bring the millennium it would hardly be worth while to take the risk of reducing production in order to gain so small a result but now we are in a position to realize the fallacy of such an argument the tax which capital levies upon labor is not the amount which capital takes for itself but the amount which it prevents labor from producing the real injury of the profit system is not that it pays so large a reward to a ruling class it is the iron ring which it fastens about industry barring the workers from access to the machinery of production except when the product can be sold for a profit labor pays an enormous reward to the businessman for his management of industry but it would pay labor to reward the businessman even more highly if only he would take his goods in kind and would permit labor after this tax is paid to go on making those things which labor itself so desperately need but you see the businessman does not take his goods in kind the owner of a great automobile factory may make for himself one automobile or a score of automobiles but he quickly comes to the limit where he has no use for any more and what he wants is to sell automobiles and make money he does not permit his workers to make automobiles for themselves or for anyone else he reserves the product of the factory for himself and when he can no longer sell automobiles at a profit he shuts the workers out and automobile making comes to an end in that community thus it appears that the iron ring which strangles the income of labor strangles equally the income of capital it paralyzes the whole social body and so limits production that we can form no conception of what prosperity might and ought to be consider the situation before the war we were all of us at work under the competitive system with the exception of a few parasites and everybody was occupied pretty close to the limit of his energy if any one had said that it would be possible for our community to pitch in and double or treble our output you would have laughed at him but suddenly we found ourselves at war and in need of a great increase in output and we resolved one and all to achieve this end we did not waste any time in theoretical discussions about the rights of private capital or the dangers of bureaucracy and the destruction of initiative our government stepped in and took control it took the railroads and systematized them it took the big factories and told them exactly what to make it took the raw materials and allotted them where they were needed it fixed the prices of labor and ordered millions of men to this or that place to this or that occupation it even seized the foodstuffs and directed what people should eat in a thousand ways it suppressed competition and replaced it by order and system and what was the result 
we took five million of our young men the very cream of our industrial force and withdrew them from all productive activities we put them into uniforms and put them through a training which meant that they were eating more food and wearing more clothing and consuming more goods than nine-tenths of them had ever done in their lives before we built camps for them and supplied them with all kinds of costly products of labor such as guns and cartridges automobiles and airplanes we treated two million of them to an expensive trip to europe and there we set them to work burning up and destroying the products of industry to the value of many billions of dollars and not only did we supply our own armies we supplied the armies of all our allies we built millions of dollars worth of ships and we sent over to europe whether by private business or by government loans some ten billion dollars worth of goods more than ten years of our exports before the war all the labor necessary to produce all this wealth had to be withdrawn from industry so far as concerned our domestic uses and needs it would not be too much to say that from domestic industry we withdrew a total of ten million of our most capable labor force i think it would be reasonable to say that two-thirds of our productive energies went to war purposes and only one-third was available for home use and yet we did it without a particle of real suffering many of us worked hard but few of us worked harder than usual most of us got along with less wheat and sugar but nobody starved nobody really suffered ill health and our poor made higher wages and had better food than ever in their lives before if this argument is sound it proves that our productive machinery is capable when properly organized and directed of producing three times the common necessities of our population assuming that our average working day is nine hours we could produce what we at present consume by three hours of intelligently directed work per day let us look at the matter from another angle just at present the hero of the american business man is herbert hoover and mr hoover recently appointed a committee not of socialists and utopians but of engineering experts to make a study of american productive methods the report showed that american industry was only thirty five or forty per cent efficient incidentally this committee on waste assessed in the case of the building industry sixty five per cent of the blame against management and only twenty one per cent against labor in six fundamental industries it assessed fifty per cent of the blame against management and less than twenty five per cent against labor fifteen years ago a professor of engineering sidney a reeve by name made an elaborate study of the wastes involved in our haphazard and planless industrial methods and embodied his findings in a book the cost of competition his conclusion was that of the total amount of energy expended in america more than seventy per cent was wasted we were doing one hundred per cent of work and getting thirty per cent of the results if we would get one hundred per cent of the results we should produce three and one-third times as much wealth and the income of our workers would be increased one or two thousand dollars a year robert blatchford in his book merry england has a saying to the effect that it makes all the difference when half a dozen men go out to catch a horse whether they spend their time catching the horse or keeping one another from catching the horse our next task will be to point out a few of the ways in which good honest american businessmen and working men laboring as intelligently and conscientiously as they know how waste their energies in keeping one another from producing goods <laughs> 